you know. Anyway, eventually, um, my father went, um, you know, he, he, my father was born in Uganda. I'm born in Uganda. My father was born here in 1932. I was born here in 1956. Um, and we were, at the time, my father was in a place called Kabatoro, which is in uh, the western part of Uganda. Um, it's it's a, it, uh, um, and uh, you know f he was uh, he, he he had a a shop there he had a canteen he was running in the game park and there's a, a fuel station and when the time came for us to study we were we had to be put in a boarding school so when five years old you know I, I had to be sent to Kampala for education. And the only form of transport from a place like that was either a train or on the back of a, uh, a neighbor's lorry. You know, um, we had to, you know, uh, hitch a hike or request them to, it would take you eight or ten hours on those muddy roads in those days to reach Kampala. You can imagine if you, you know, so. That's the kind of life, you know, we've had. Um, my father was basically a, a middle-class man. He was not rich, he was not poor. He made sure that um, uh, there was enough good food on the table. Um, he made sure that we had uh, four plates of, four pairs of clothes every year. One was the beginning of the school term, uh, two pairs. And two pairs we got when it was the Diwali. Diwali is a Hindu New Year. So the, the day before the New Year, you, 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 you get these two, two, two pairs of nice clothes. Um, and that's the kind of background I have. Um, in 72, um, I left Uganda uh, and followed my parents to UK. I was 16 years old. And the moment I land, landed in the UK, <clears throat> I had to support myself. Um, I was in London, my parents were up, up north of, 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 of England. And uh, I, I think I was ambitious from a very young age. Um, I remember that uh, uh, one of the first things I wanted to do uh, it's sort of, you know, staying in a bed sitters, paying six pounds a night, I, I had to buy my own house, you know. So I had to take on two jobs. And um, which I managed to do. I used to work in the weekdays and then uh, I used to drive a, a, a taxi at the weekend in England support myself. In the end, I also s had to do a bit of education. I met my wife, um, and uh, she also insisted I must study. So I started my Bo uh, 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 evening classes. So I, I had two jobs and an evening class, you know? And when I was 18 years old, I paid a deposit for a house and I got a mortgage. Um, and this I, is my first property in England. And, uh, uh, um, and uh, I worked, uh, I, I, did, I did many jobs in England to make my ends meet. I worked as a, you know, as a baker, as a butcher. I worked in a supermarket filling shelves. You know, no job has been too small for me or too big for me. You know, so <clears throat> I think it's important that uh, if you want to achieve your aims, uh, re re we go through all this. Um, I worked hard and uh, in the end, you know, Africa is either in your blood or it's not in your blood. Um, and for me, Africa is my blood through and through. I was doing well in the UK. I decided I left everything and I came back 
uh, came to Uganda in 1985. Um, and, and of course, one of the things that one has to do when you come back is so first you have to pay your rent, you have to pay your, you know, you set up oh, everything again. Um, and of course, I had to look for something to do, business. I, it took me one and a half years to find out what I wanted to do. You know, I had a limited capital. So in uh, December 1986, I started my first uh, shop in, on Kampala Road with a capital of $25,000. And I think soon, um, we, we, the first business we did was buying salt, if I can remember. Um, and we turned it around within a week. I was lucky I made $5,000. It was very sweet. <laughs> and then I started dealing in beer. The... One of the most interesting was that uh, my capital was limited, um, so I started buying from the people who used to import. And, and, and <clears throat> one of my first consignment, um, which was delivered to us, um, the importer wouldn't, wouldn't trust me. Um, so I paid him up front, I started buying, started building up the business, and um, <clears throat> Then eventually, what would happen, uh, he liked me and uh, we started doing business and, and I, said, I would tell him, listen, I'll pay you 50% now, come after two days at four o'clock, your money is waiting for you. So he trusted me, he, he brought the, sold me the beers, took his 50% and after two days at four o'clock he came, his money was waiting for him. And then his friend came doing the same thing and I think we built up the trust. You know, the, at that time, the whole of the infrastructure, the, the whole infrastructure and business, and everything was broken down here. You know, it had not stopped. Everything was moving, but it had broken down. There was no trust. People didn't trust anybody. Um, and, 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 and this is the kind of the environment we, we were in. Um, and, and, but it, I managed to, also in the process, I managed to make good friends. Joji, our late uh, brother, we became very f good friends uh, and began to the family. And in the, in the process, we all teamed, you know, with Joji and us, we all teamed up uh, and, 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 and really moved the, the beer business from a retail into an imported one. So we started importing beers ourselves. And you know, in a few years, we were like number one beer trader in the country. And, and what it did for us, it created a cash flow. Now, when you start with $25,000, what is the most important thing in your first business? You need to create a business which gives you cash flow. It's a stepping stone to many other things. And of course, when the, uh, by 1990 or 1989, the beer business came to a standstill. But what we had done in the process was uh, build up a network of uh, people who come and sell you beers. They, they need local currency. Um, so I was a one-stop shop for anybody who wanted to buy beer and who wanted Uganda shillings. I needed a foreign currency. And Eventually, we evolved from a, a wholesale, I mean, beer wholesaler into a, a phone exchange. In 1990, uh, they liberalized the phone exchange dealings and current Forex Bureau was established. Within six months, we actually became the number one Forex dealer, bigger than most of these, all the banks here, practically. And we did very well for a few years. Again, cash was building. And customers were all, you know, coming up well. Now, when the bank saw that Crane Forex has become the biggest dealer, 
they form the cartel to say, how do we stop this? The only way to stop this, this guy is competing with us is to have created a lot of bank charges because we still had to go through the banks. So they created a lot of heavy charges for all the transactions. Now, of course, we are not going to sit and take it. As businessmen, you have a plan B. And the plan B was to s how to go into banking business. Um, banks uh, need a lot of capital, uh, which we had by then. We had created a very strong network of friends, business colleagues, a lot of business was being done. Um, the process also, we started lending money to business people who um, had need for it. And uh, in, in, in 21st August 1995, Cranbank opened its doors. Now, can you imagine how many professional people I have to employ? I needed about six expatriate staff and about 20 uh, Ugandan staff to start. You know, when you're, in, when you're in business, you never think about your salary. But the first thing you have to think is to make sure that the, the people you employ, you have to pay them the salary in time. And that was the hardest thing for a person like me who had to employ these people and I, I needed them and uh, to make sure that, the, that every month, you can imagine for the first six months you, you don't even do business, but you have to pay them $20,000 a month just on salaries, earning nothing. It's, a, it's not much money now, but in those days, in 1995, it was a lot of money, a lot of money. So that was one of the hardest, but eventually um, um, hard work, dedication, uh, and support, most of all the support from the business community, Patrick and uh, all my other colleagues, really, we in the first year of operations, we made profit. And this is very unusual. Eventually, we spread out into real estate, into hotels. Of course, all this investment we were doing also started reaping its benefits. But one of the, my most uh, I would say, uh, was my passion was Munyonyo, but it needed a lot of money. And, as, as, and, and I couldn't put all the money in one go because first I didn't have it. Second thing, if I did it, it would stop all my other businesses. So bit, we, you know, as we went along, we started investing. And everybody I meet will tell me, are you think it's going to work? They were polite. They, are you, do you think it's going to work? I said, I don't know, but it's not something, I, I don't ever, um, you know, I just wanted people to come, um, use the facilities, come for a weekend, on a, on a Sunday, we used to uh, have fried fish under the mango tree, you know, and that was my passion. Of course, in Munyonyo from there uh, changed. I, and I also remember one day, my seven-year-old son came to me, and I think this is what my wife, you know, must have uh, told me. He said, I said, I said, Dad, this Munyonyo is going to bankrupt us. So I looked at this little boy and, you know, I, I smile. Can you know, imagine seven year old coming to tell you you're going to bankrupt the family? I'm the one who's made the money. <laughs> and I, I'm working and he's telling me that he's going to bankrupt. But I smile at him, you know, I still remind him, but. And today, as you can see, what Munyonyo is, and, and, and uh, is beyond even my expectations, you know. But it's a beautiful place. It's, for, it's in Uganda, and it's for Ugandans. You know, I'm just uh, uh, somebody who keeps it going.